Hello, welcome to the Impersonal Opinion Podcast. This is the podcast where we don't take our opinions personally. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with Mitch J and Michael Walsh, and they wanted to talk a little bit about politics and the candidates who's running and, and the implications of who's elected and all that stuff. And I'm a complete ignoramus about politics, so I'm going to turn it over to Michael Walsh, and he's going to start us off. Thanks, Chandler. Uh, so what I basically have in mind for this podcast is for us to just talk about the up and coming presidential election and what's been going on in the cycle so far and kind of relate that to not necessarily free will, but I guess the other two sections of our podcast, which is science and religion. And the reason why I want to do that is because we have some, uh, pretty fervent and, uh, declared, uh, science deniers who are running for president right now who are promising to uh, build up our military, increase uh, energy production in fossil fuels. Uh, they want to ignore clean energy uh, and they want to roll back a lot of the uh, things that we've had Obama do, like health care, for example. Um, and uh, this has an implication on science and, and religion and there's also uh, many uh, very strong religious fanatics, I guess you can say, to, to, to put it mildly, who are running for, for office. And uh, the decisions that they could potentially make are big. So I'll give you uh, one example. Uh, Ted Cruz is number two right now in the Republican uh, race. He's just behind Donald Trump. And in Iowa, he's polling at number one, just ahead of uh, Trump. And uh, one of the reasons because of that is because Iowa has a huge evangelical base for uh, for the Republicans. It, they, they may evangelicals make up about 65 percent of the voting block there. So any Republican who wants to win Iowa has to do really well with uh, evangelicals. And Ted Cruz has come out as one of the most conservative religious candidates we've had in a long time. And so he's doing very well with them. And uh, he promises to roll back Obamacare completely. Uh, and he wants to basically put God back in the classroom. He's not a secularist. Uh, he thinks that uh, the secularism that we have now is somehow an assault on religious liberties. And this view is uh, also echoed among many of the Republican candidates like uh, Mike Huckabee and Rick Santorum and Ben Carson, for example. Uh, and what, what, would, what would it be like if Senator Ted Cruz got elected into the White House? And you also have to consider that, you know, the president is not a king. They can't do everything. You, they still have to go through Congress, and there's still things that the Supreme Court does. But many of our Supreme Court justices are old. They're in their 70s and 80s, and they're going to be retiring in the next eight years. And the next president is a very likely chance that he or she is going to be allow, be able to appoint two or three Supreme Court justices. And if someone like Ted Cruz, for example, who's a very, very strong religious conservative, if he gets elected, who do you think he's going to appoint to the Supreme Court? If he, if he appoints two or three very conservative religious judges who, you know, uh, agree with his political perspectives and ideology, that'll basically give the Supreme Court a, a, a majority that can never be challenged in the favor of the conservative leaning points of view. And that has the potential to overwrite uh, the same-sex marriage uh, uh, passage uh, last year, last summer. Uh, and Obamacare, and many, 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 many other things. And so the implications, uh, the potential for uh, change, dramatic change to what we see in the U.S., what we have seen, all the progress we've seen recently, is huge. So I just want to put you put that kind of uh, question out to you guys. Like, what guys, right. what, what do you think about um, just in general the, the election and some of the more conservative people who's running running for office right now. Well, well, well said, Mike. I, I, another issue to take into point: some other powers of the president, of course, that's very relevant, are executive actions, right? So, for example, recently, a teary-eyed Obama 
released some new uh, executive actions related to gun control. And he had done that uh, several years previously. I think back in 2013, he had done that as well. So, yeah, although we do have um, our government divided into three branches and the executive branch is really only one branch, it's true that the president holds a great deal of power. Um, and that uh, if we have political figures who don't make policy changes based on um, enlightened secular ideals, it can be very dangerous. It'll be regressive as a people, as a country. It'll be pretty, pretty horrible if we keep on um, relying on these archaic anti-scientific uh, notions. That's uh, it's absolutely true. Um, yeah. So, you know, yeah. we usually we talk about, you know, free will all the time. But as Trick Slattery likes to say, what comes first is rationality. Excuse me, by the way, I have a bit of a sore throat. So my voice is a little bit strained. Um, rationality has to come first. That's what has to come first at all times. Right. It's about logic. It's about reason. It's about compassion. And. When you're being a logical, reasonable person, you're able to examine certain provocative issues such as free will, such as um, major political uh, changes, policy changes, with a clear mind, with an objective mind. And that'll help you deter get uh, um, better solutions. And when I say better, I mean effective, moral, logical solutions. So yeah, if we get the wrong candidate, Whatever that means. Uh, it's definitely a problem. I think this whole, this Republican Party really needs to change. I mean, the Republican Party used to be a party that just opposed the Democrats based on the fear of having a really large government and based on having a difference of opinion when it came to the role of government and certain economic policies. But in recent decades, somehow the Republican Party has absorbed the religious right. So now they're a very confusing bunch with a very inconsistent philosophy. And this inconsistent philosophy just leads to horrible things. Destruction of the environment, um, inequality, lack of civil rights, lack of, you know, especially women's rights, gay rights, things like that. So, yeah, I mean... Um, Apparently, the Democratic hopeful for, for liberalism and for forward thinking is Bernie Sanders. I don't know if he's the best guy for the job, but out of the, uh, the popular candidates that we see on TV, he's definitely the guy, right? Yeah, he's the, he's the favorite uh, among most millennials and among most in the, the secular, quote-unquote, crowd. Because uh, he was on Jimmy Kimmel a few months ago. And Kimmel's, Kimmel was yeah. like, because he mentioned God. Uh, Bernie Sanders mentioned God. He was like, oh, thank God, or something like that. He, he made like an offhand, you know, like, I, well, like I co commonly, this, yeah. like, colloquially invoke God, like, you know, God damn, or something like that. And so Jimmy, like, uh, caught on this and it was like, oh, well, speaking of God, like, uh, do you believe in God? Because, I mean, it is kind of ambiguous. He, he's like one of the least religious uh, politicians, especially, and he's probably one of the least religious politicians running for president that we've had in probably more than 100 years. Yeah. And so Bernie Sanders kind of dodged the question. He, he, he kind of invoked like the spiritual but not religious pos uh, position without actually saying it. And he, he said, look, I'm, I'm basically – Huh? He believes in people. Yeah. He said he believes in people and he believes in this idea that the universe should not be such – that it helps out the, uh, the richest people at the expense of the majority of people. So he's essentially a populist at heart. And I agree. I mean, politically speaking, I, I consider myself a left-leaning independent populist. So I'm socially liberal. I'm eco economically liberal for the most part because uh, I'm a populist. Uh, but I call myself an independent because I'm not necessarily liberal on every single issue. I have a few conservative uh, positions that I take. So I consider myself a left-leaning independent populist. The Democratic Party and the Republic, uh, Republican Party, I think th there, are, there are both problems with it. With the, Republican with the Republicans today, you've got essentially two camps. 
in the Republican Party. You have the uh, Ayn Randian, like libertarian, small government camp. These are people who think that, you know, we, we need government so small that we can drown it in a bathtub, to, uh, to paraphrase Grover Norquist. They want government that basically does the three basic things, the law, the police, and military, and everything else is left to the private sector. Some of them even go further than that and don't want any government at all, like the really hardcore libertarians. But they essentially want, aside from those three things, everything to be privatized. Even prisons, for example. They want prisons to be privatized so that there's an economic incentive on prison such that the more people we arrest and, and lock up in prison, the more money prisons will make. I mean, what could possibly go wrong with that? That sounds really bad. <laughs> it's already going wrong. We already have private prisons. Yeah. Well, some prisons are already privatized. And yeah, obviously problematic. And the other uh, branch of the Republican Party is the ultra religious fundamentalist branch. I mean, these are people who the majority of whom think the earth is less than 10,000 years old and that we coexisted with dinosaurs and rode them with saddles on their back and that uh, hurricanes and tornadoes are God's punishment for us allowing gay marriage. Right. And so you got those two wings of the party. I've heard of that. Yeah. Because even though I don't follow politics at all, you know, just by listening to, you know, atheist podcasts, I hear people f being frustrated about certain politicians will say that a certain natural disaster was God's punishment because there was some gays in that area. And I'm like, there's gays in every area of the earth. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. These are people who basically still think that God is in control of the natural forces out there, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, diseases, uh, even like accidents that are uh, man-made, they still think that God makes those things happen to punish them. And they, they essentially believe that America is a Christian country and that God is protecting this country with like an invisible force shield. And that if we, you know, go against God's ways by allowing gay marriage and uh, you know, uh, allowing abortion or people to have sex outside of marriage or we don't allow God in the classroom or we take prayer out of classroom. They think that God would literally turn his back on America and let this country get destroyed, either from the inside out or from the outside in. They literally believe that. And so they literally have they, they literally think that secularism is going to lead to the destruction of this world and Armageddon somehow. And the thing is, it's really hard. How do you talk to someone? How do you have a rational conversation when your starting points, your worldview starting points are so different from the get-go? I mean, it's very, very, very hard. The good news is, is that evangelicals generally are shrinking among the population, and religious conservatism is, is, is shrinking as well. I mean, poll after poll shows that the number of people who believe in God or the number of people who are certain they believe in God versus kind of, sort of certain or not sure, they get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. But it's going to take at least another generation before this segment of the electorate uh, doesn't have, doesn't wield the political power that it does at all. So that's basically the Republican Party in a nutshell. And obviously, uh, the person who's shaking up the Republican Party is Donald Trump. And for those of us in New York, we've known Donald Trump for a long time. He's been famous in New York for at least like 35 years. And he's actually a social liberal who actually does kind of sort of have some populist economic views. Uh, but he's super, super conservative on immigration. And that's really what is uh, driving his popularity among Republicans because he's not politically correct. And he'll, he go out, he'll go out and say what he wants and what he thinks. And uh, he, he holds no bars, you know, and, and people like him for that. And so he's he's got like 40 percent of the Republican vote right now. And it's expected that he's probably going to win because, I mean, it is very unlikely that anyone else is going to top, top Trump right now. Cruz is the only chance. And Cruz has a big problem, which is that he's not generally popular in the northern states like Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire and New York and Illinois and Michigan. And those are states where Trump could do really well in and Cruz wouldn't be able to do well in. And so it's likely that Trump will win. But, you know. To a certain degree, I mean, you can say what you want about Trump, but he's he's a social liberal to, liberal to a certain extent, and he's never really been religious. He's pretending to be religious. He went out 
on stage with his little Bible, and he's like, I wrote the second greatest book ever written, except for the, the second to the Bible, of course, and that is The Art of the Deal. And he's kind of pretending to be a little bit more religion than he, religious than he is, but he's not really that religious. But I think he would actually be favorable to the secular point of view. I really don't think Trump would be hardcore religious on us at all. Um, your thoughts? This is very interesting. Um, so you're saying that we'll either end up pretty much with either Donald Trump or Ted Cruz? As a, as a nominated uh, candidate, yeah, not necessarily as president. But the, when you think of the toss-up between the two, I mean, I understand that Trump is – well, Cruz has also said he wants to deport all the illegal immigrants uh, and, and I think also slow down immigration. I'm not sure, but he wants to maybe restrict it. So just about everyone in the Republican Party wants to do that except I think maybe Marco Rubio. But if Cruz and Trump are virtually identical on, uh, uh, on immigration, then the only thing that does really set them apart is that – Trump is a bit more of a populist, and Trump is a lot more secular. He's not a religious fanatic. And so if I had the toss-up between a Trump Trump versus Cruz as president, if they're identical on immigration, then I would pick Trump over Cruz. What would uh, what are your, what were your thoughts? What would you pick? Well, well I, I, I know I've been known to vote for um, – I have a history of only voting for independent third-party candidates. Like I – I really scrutinize platforms, and it's really based on, you know, I have a certain uh, certain criteria, you know? It's like, um, the first thing I look for is, uh, what are you saying? Do you mean what you say? Are you competent? Are you capable in in doing what you say you're going to do? You know, so I sort of, so I sort of vet uh, potential um, candidates that way. That's how I go through it. So I'm not really a lesser of two evil voter, but yeah, but but going back to Trump, Trump is a Democrat. Trump is not a Republican. Trump is a a centrist. He is a Democrat. In the past, he was, um, for example, he was a strident supporter of women's rights, um, insofar that he was um, pro-choice and was a strong one of the stronger voices for uh, the pro-choice movement. He's donated a lot more to Democrats than candidates prior to Democrats than Republicans prior to, uh, I don't know, 2011, let's say, sometime before that. And I think Trump, I don't think he's a genuine person. I think he's the kind of guy that just wants to win. He just wants to be successful. He's a rich person, and he strategically decided that running as a Republican is his best way uh, during this election to win. And that's what he's doing. And certainly economically, Financially, he's a Republican, certainly. But I think when it comes to social aspects, historically, if you check his track record, he's a Democrat through and through. But I, I, I don't yeah. want to really dwell too much on the the candidates um, themselves, you know, because they're really just, you know, people have to vote for candidates. So candidates, no matter how cynical you are as a voter, the truth is we create these candidates. Our system creates these people, as George Carlin uh, famously and humorously said in the past. So the real issue is what's wrong with us? Why do Americans why do Americans feel like these are the best representatives of what we want as a society? What does the world want and how can we get this society to change their views? Why don't people value logic and reason? Nick Vale, for example, uh, a member of this band of free will skeptics and an infrequent uh, host of the free will science and religion podcast. He does the, the TV show, the New York TV show, which is on this Wednesday, by the way, check your local listings. It's on uh, cable access TV. If you live in the Manhattan area of New York, anyway, Nick Vale often remarks that um, why don't, these presidential candidates, why don't these politicians talk about free will? Well, a lot of them aren't even willing to talk about global warming, much less free will. And why is that? The reason is because it's political suicide, because people don't want to elect people. Well, some people don't want to elect people who... Um, Look at the issue of global warming with uh, scientific objectivity and have decided and have just come to the conclusion that, yeah, 
human activity is a problem. It's causing pollution. It's causing the overall temperature of the earth to increase. And this is problematic. So I think the big shift that we need really in our society is we have to teach in schools at a young age. We need to teach logic. We need to teach politics. We need to teach philosophy. These shouldn't be electives. These shouldn't be like things that you fancy once you get to college. These should be mandatory things that we're teaching young people you know, right from the get-go. Some basic stuff about truth tables, because this is about reality. We should be studying the nature of reality with logical, scientific clarity from a young age. And I think if we can create that kind of cultural shift, that will lead to us having better candidates, because the people who elect these candidates will value different things. Yeah, no, I uh, I agree. I definitely think that uh, we should teach critical thinking, logic, and philosophy in school, certainly in high school, maybe even earlier, just to teach kids the basics of what is a coherent argument. You know, we should they should go through all these the, the standard uh, fallacious types of arguments, like the ad hominem attack, That's the it. argument from authority. The, they, they should be given like an, a, a piece of paper that where someone makes like, like a short paragraph or so or one page and then everyone is, gets the same paper and someone makes a fallacious argument and the student should be asked to find what is wrong with this argument and that they should like write up their response and that will be part of the test. So they'll have to like read the, the argument that the person gives and just find out what's wrong with it. Do they appeal to authority or do they, is it an ad hominem attack? Is it logically fallacious somehow? And that'll teach critical thinking because when you when I debate politics and religion with people or even just regular day-to-day -day social issues, you see people making faulty arguments, fallacious arguments all the time and they don't even know it. You know, people will just argue like, oh, most uh, doctors agree with X, therefore X is true. Or they'll just say – Oh, that guy, that guy's a freaking womanizer. You can't trust him. Yep. I mean, it's yep. total ad hominem. And it's like, it's not a response. And I, I, I uh, this past uh, holiday, I have an uncle who is super conservative, but he's not like the typical Fox News type. He's even like more conservative than that. And he's actually uh, a, uh, like a somewhat of, he has like a lot of old school, like racist tendencies. You know, he's a baby boomer. He grew up in like the sixties and seventies when, when there were like no Asians and there were no Latinos and there was, it was like 90% white and there were some black people, but like the black people back then like knew their place, quote unquote. And there were no gay people. They were all in the closet. And he, he likes that America. You know, he's like reminiscent of that old America from the 60s before the gays and the blacks and the immigrate and immigrants, you know, ruined it. And uh, so we were debating politics. And all I heard from him was one logically fallacious argument after another. Right. And I tried pointing it out and he just wouldn't hear it. He just he, he just reiterates his point over again or he changed the subject or he, that's it. And it's like we we have to prevent that way of thinking because right. there's so much nonsense on the Internet that is totally false, just false. You know, no one fact checks the Internet. Anybody with a blog or a website or a YouTube channel can put up whatever they want on the Internet. And there are, so, there are millions of people who grab this stuff and think it's true based on authority or merely just because it sounds like what they want to be true. And they go out and they make these their talking points when they're out voting, when they're out having conversations with people. And you hear total nonsense. And so I agree with you. It's absolutely critical that we teach uh, critical yeah. thinking, logic, and philosophy. It shouldn't be something that we do at college because uh, less than half of Americans go to college and people can't afford it. And even then in college, those are like elective classes. It should be mandatory classes at least in high school. I agree. It's too late. It makes it seem unimportant. When you, if you have to wait till college to take this, it makes it seem like this is not important. It gives the wrong impression. How can anyone have an argument – without knowing the basics of an argument. Even going back to our criticism of the modern Republican Party, um, there's this, oftentimes, you know, Republicans are criticized from the left as spreading this sort of anti-intellectualism. And I think it's a fair criticism. Like, you know, uh, Mike, I, you know, just like uh, you were alluding to, I'm that kind of guy too. You know, when, when I'm in a conversation, not always, but 
depending on um, who I'm uh, arguing with, I am the kind of person that will be like, oh, that, that's a straw man. Oh, that's that, that's that's an ad hominem, uh, ad populum. You can't say that. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll say those kind of things just to keep the person on check, just to say, look, uh, you, you're not going to win this conversation by cheating. We need to follow these rules that we have or else we can't make points. Without logic, you can't make an argument. You can't defend any position if you're not willing to play by the rules um, of reason. So, yeah, I mean, um, and it's not acceptable. It really isn't. We need to change this idea that it is acceptable to do this. We need to learn how to have an argument before we argue. It's just, right, I mean, right. I, I don't know why people don't understand this. I don't, I'm not really sure why certain political parties are afraid of this, but this is the way to do things. Right, so, and uh, I guess maybe to add to that, and maybe to, to, to be fair, uh, there are liberals who also succumb to the same kind of... Uh, uh, methodology, thinking methodology uh, of this way, and uh, there all there are also atheists who do it as well. And I think one of the most important things we can do as critical thinkers is to uh, critically reflect on our own beliefs and the beliefs of our own community or subculture or sector, whatever the hell it is that you belong to or you feel like you're a part of. Uh, because, you know, I myself have had conversations with, with liberals who, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a big thing di dividing liberals right now between the left and the regressive left, and uh, it, it's cutting liberals in half, and some of the, some of the, 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 the uh, arguments from the left, which I feel a point of, uh, part of, and not the so-called quote-unquote regressive left that's getting a lot of traction now, uh, is is something around political correction, for example. I mean, liberals lo gen in general love political correction. But here's the problem about, about political correction. Sometimes political correction forces you to deny reality in the name of not offending someone or some group. And right. once you allow that to happen, once you deny facts merely because those facts may be inconvenient truths that may be offensive to a certain group of people, once you allow that to happen, you're allowing your ideology to overcome uh, your rationality uh, and your commitment to truth and evidence. And once that happens, as it happens both on the left and the right, and both among religious people and uh, atheists, you know, I'm not going to say that um, – atheists or liberals or like me or, or people even who identify themselves as quote-unquote free thinkers are immune to it. We all have confirmation biases. We all have all the cognitive biases that uh, are nicely listed on the, the Wikipedia page about it. Uh, and we have to constantly fight it. You know, I, since I started learning about this stuff, I even I myself, I constantly see myself, find myself uh, succumbing to confirmation bias or many of the other biases. And I'll be like, oh, you know what? I'm actually doing exactly what I'm against. Holy shit. And I'll just have to stop and reassess myself and, and change it. And it's very hard because it's, it's a natural human tendency to towards a way of thinking. And we all have it. And our brains are all, in a sense, hardwired that way. And our cultures generally and our social peer pressure groups also reinforce those things. And so it's a daily struggle against them. And so I would just say that, you know, we all have this and we all have to uh, have to fight against it. And that's why critical thinking is so important. Well, both of you guys have said something that I strongly agree with, and that is that, you know, logic and critical thinking, you know, and how to avoid these logical fallacies definitely needs to be taught earlier rather than as some elective in college. Like you said, most people aren't even going to college. And I think what Mitch said was that when you delay something like that, it makes it sound unimportant. So if it's just something that once in a while, a small group of people who go to college and a small group of those people elect a certain subject and learn about it, basically means that 1% or maybe some, a very small amount of Americans are going to learn that. And so instead of there, it should be in elementary or middle or high school or something, something that everybody is exposed to. 
Yeah, it makes no sense. We teach math, but we don't teach the logic behind the math. You teach science, but you don't teach the logic behind the science. You just completely ignore philosophy, which, you know, and, and philosophy sort of answers the questions that uh, science and math don't answer sometimes, you know? And it's, and historically, philosophy, I mean, Mike probably knows this better than I do, but historically, philosophy was, you know, a very respectable uh, means of investigating the truth. That's what philosophy is all about, you know what I mean? Nowadays, its reputation has been sullied, I guess, but I, I just feel like people have this really convoluted idea of how to structure an argument, why something should be true, and why something should not be true, and trying to figure out, you know, right from wrong. Here's, here's a great example. Here's, here's a great example. So, um, do gay people choose to be gay? So, as free will skeptics, what would we say? We would say, no, because no one chooses anything. <laughs> there you go. It's that easy. It's so simple. Gay people don't choose to be gay because no one chooses anything. Now, well, how do you explain the fact that people go into prison straight and come out gay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm just going to ignore that one. But anyway, but um so but but so but many Democrats, many liberals have this feeling. They intuitively understand something is wrong with saying gay people choose to be gay. And they're trying to figure out why. They're trying to figure out how to defend these oppressed peoples. But it's really rare that they actually make the argument that needs to be made. And this is one of the reasons why um, their opposition on the right is able to combat them. Because they're not making the best argument. Because their argument really isn't all about logic, it's about feeling. People on the left intuitively and rightfully feel that gay people are being oppressed, and it doesn't sound right to them when a, when, a, when, so when a member from the right goes, they choose this. They recognize how people can sometimes be the victims of circumstance, as instead of always realizing that we're always victims of circumstance. So, so this is the problem. If you want to fight for civil rights, guess what? The best way to fight for civil rights is to understand some rudimentary logic, be reasonable, and invest, and ultimately investigate the issue of free will. Because after you've investigated that issue, then you can develop this ultimate form of empathy when you see that everyone is just a product of their environment and a victim of circumstance. Not to just a moderate degree, but to the greatest degree, to the ultimate degree. We are entirely just the products of our biology and our environment and stimuli in, in the environment. That's it. So, I, yeah, I mean, I'm going to try not to be repetitive. It's, it's a little bit difficult for you sometimes. But, yeah, I, I agree, Mike. The, the, the problem here is, again, we need people to appreciate different things. We need to change the zeitgeist. We need people to understand the best way to arrive at these reasonable conclusions. It should not be based on intuition and feeling. It should be based on reason. Right. Uh, the only problem is that <laughs> conservatives in general are against this. I mean, consider this, for example. This is from the Washington Post, dated July 9th, 2012. The headline is, Texas GOP, which is the Republican Party, rejects, quote-unquote, critical thinking skills. And here's one of the... What? Um, uh, yeah. It, it, it wrote in a 2012 platform, this is what it actually wrote, knowledge-based education, and dash, it says this about it. We oppose the teaching of higher-order thinking skills, critical thinking skills, and similar programs that are simply a reliable, a, a relabeling of outcome-based education, which focus on behavior modification and have the purpose of challenging the students' fixed beliefs and undermining parental authority. So this, all this that we're against, there's a huge slice of the Republican Party that are absolutely against this, and they will fight to have critical thinking skills banned from school. It's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. That's I've I've never seen such a bladed and honest <laughs> comment before. Like, hey, yeah. uh, 
we don't want children to think for themselves because uh, yeah. we just want them to believe what we tell them. <laughs> I appreciate their honesty there. <laughs> yeah. They want them to believe whatever their parents told them, and they know that that's going to be like traditional Christian beliefs and values. Is that what you would call an argument from parental authority? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Father knows right. Yeah, yeah so uh, the, the GOP... Uh, the, the the social conservative wing of the GOP, which is the evangelical, mostly religious side of it, which would be people like Ted Cruz, Ben Carson, Mike Huckabee, and several others, they are absolutely opposed to almost everything we stand for in terms of the way we want society to be. We want it to be secular. We want it to be open. We want people to have equal rights. We want critical thinking permeated throughout the entire culture they want it to be a christian country where rights are limited according to what they think god wants rights to be they want critical thinking bans they want religion in the classroom and prayer in the classroom they want to basically turn all public schools into a platform for them to teach their personal brand of christian theism i mean we probably shouldn't generalize um we shouldn't make sweeping generalities about every republican but certainly in order to call yourself a Republican, um, logically, it means there's a checklist of positions. And when you go through that list, a majority of them, or at least when it comes to the most important ones, you check those off. You go, I identify as a Republican because I agree with these particular positions. And we've said before, historically, it's been um, to be a Republican meant you were fearful of the government. You didn't want the government to become too powerful. You also didn't want the church to become too powerful. That's what's really changed about the Republican Party. Like I said, in recent decades, they've absorbed this, you know, the, these Christian conservatives. But originally, like a Hamiltonian Republican, for example, would be, like, um, uh, would be very much against the idea of church. We want the separation of church and state. So, yeah, being a Republican is supposed to mean you don't want the church to have power. You don't want the government to be powerful. Both states. You want state rights. Um, you want the government to have a small role, so there's the libertarian aspect of it. You only want it to do the basic functions and not interfere with business. And even though I disagree with these, at least this seems kind of reasonable. To me, it seems reasonable to be fearful of a government, especially what a government could potentially be. But obviously, this modern, muddied Republican Party is just full of illogic. It's full of just nonsense. And the way to get away from that is through education. It's through educating the young. I mean, I don't know how we as individuals can happen to spread the message, but it's definitely a message that needs to be spread. Right, right. And for the record, though, I, I was only talking about a certain wing of the Republican Party. It's okay. mostly the uh, socially conservative religious wing of the Republican Party. Um, the libertarian wing is not so much against this. I mean, I haven't heard any of them who are against critical thinking skills uh, in school. Um, yeah, the, the uh, libertarian wing is generally not as powerful, though, as the uh, religious wing uh, has been, at least since the uh, since the 80s, when uh, when the Jerry Falwell became like BFFs with Ronald Reagan and tried to inject hardcore Christian conservative values into the uh, into the agenda, the presidential agenda. Yeah, so um, it's it's a little disturbing, and uh, that's why I do think that uh, that the politics is very important, especially for people concerned about the issues. You don't have to care about the politicians or the parties, but if you're concerned about the issues, you know, I hear people who I have a coworker, for example, mm -hmm. and we occasionally talk politics. It comes up from time to time, and you know, he he's a liberal leaning kind of guy and uh he spouses a lot of uh, he you know he has hatred towards some of the more conservative talking points uh that republicans have and positions that they have but here's the thing though he doesn't vote he thinks voting is retarded it's a waste of time and i've telling i've been telling him over and over again that people like you are the problem because if enough people like you who hold your point of view, went out and voted, not only in general elections for presidents, but for local elections, right. the country could change overnight. You know, gone would be all this ridiculousness that you have coming out from, like, the likes of Ted Cruz and Ben Carson and these kinds of people. They would be gone overnight. 
the next election cycle, they'd be gone. But the problem yeah, is Elections a lot of people just don't vote. Votes. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of liberal-leaning people, they just don't vote. They uh, And my friend uh, Paul, who you met, he's another one of these guys. He never votes, or when he does vote, he votes for, like, totally, totally obscure third-party candidates. Like, the guy who's running his campaign from his garage and, uh, you know, has a podcast, and that that's his whole platform. You know, he never votes for, like... I, I do think that at some t- at some point you do it is it is uh, worthwhile to vote for the lesser of two evils. I mean, you don't always have the ideal candidate, but if enough people don't vote for the lesser of two evils, then the people who are voting for the evil of the two evils, they're going to come out and vote, and the, you're going to get the worst president of the two. And I mean, ideally, well, the ideal candidate would be great, but voting for the lesser there's nothing wrong with it. But there are so many people who are like. I'm not voting for a candidate who I disagree with on one issue. And it's like you don't have to agree with the guy on everything. You know, just if you agree with them on 70, 80 percent of stuff and the other you disagree with the guy, even the other guy, even more vote for the lesser of two evils. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, um, I have an interesting question, guys. Wouldn't it be better if the citizens, instead of voting for candidates for these political offices, voted on the issues themselves? Well, they they do have that in certain states. Like California, if you get enough signatures, you can put anything on the ballot, including a law that would prevent people from being able to get enough signatures to put something on a ballot. (laughs) <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, like Prop Eight, the 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 uh, the anti-gay thing that they had in 2008, uh, all sorts of things on like food stamps and who gets access to that. They put it on the ballot. You get enough signatures, you can do it. Not every state has that though, but states like California do. Uh, weed marijuana legalization was uh, on the ballot, uh, voted for in Oregon last year, so that that got put on. And so yeah, people do do this actually. I think that's actually a much more efficient system because in that way, um, for one thing, here's one of the problems with voting is that how in the world when you're given a list of people to vote for, how would you would have to know each of those people and what their position was on every single issue and how can you possibly know that unless they're like your best friend you've known them your whole life and so how in the world does it make sense to vote for strange people you don't know and then having them be in the government uh, deciding on these issues i think that it should it if i think it would be more of a democratic system if ever, the citizens were all voting on certain issues and that was a widespread thing not just certain states well you could uh you could get uh, well. You could you could find out a candidate's positions by going to their site, and a lot of newspapers like uh, the Washington Post and a lot of Politico and those kinds of politically oriented sites and organizations, they will uh, tally up the all the the candidates' positions on every single subject, and you can get like charts that like color coded and see where they fall, and you can for the most part have a basic understanding of a candidate, but they could always change their mind when they get elected uh they could always flip flop you know from point you may have a candidate that says one thing one time and another thing another time and so you can't always be sure but for the most part you can get uh a candidate's views on on most of the subjects yeah see that's my point is that i don't trust in people but i you know what i mean because they're dishonest because they'll just say whatever it is to get elected you know and so I think that it, it would just be much more efficient and a time saver if people were voting on the issues directly. And I really, I, I don't know, I mean, it seems to me more like wh- whoever you vote for, because they're going to be disagreeing with you on probably one or more issues, you're always working against yourself no matter who you vote for. Right. That is true. Uh, it's, it's very rare that you meet a candidate that's on your page 100% of the time, especially the way we have our political systems oriented. I mean, Democrats are generally for the, the more populist economic views, but uh, those views would actually help out uh, most people, poor people, for example, in the South. But most poor people in the South 
uh, especially those who are white, vote Republican. And Republicans hold economic views that are totally antithetical to helping out poor white people in the South. And so they, they vote for Republicans based on certain, you know, like socially conservative views or certain scare tactics that they hear, like, you know, the liberals want to take away all your guns and stuff like that. And so they're always voting against their, their best interests, at least on some things like economics, no matter what. And so in a way, it's kind of unavoidable. But you know what? I was looking at uh, Germany recently, and Germany has like 15 different political parties. And can you imagine what it would be like if you had that in America? Like you could have the Communist Party, you have the Socialist Party, you might have like the neo-Nazi party, you'll have the libertarian party, you'll have the socially conservative party, you'll have the Christian party, well, you'll have the fair, Jewish Mike, party, the have, Muslim party. We do have an abundance of political parties. It's just that the way the rules are set up in America is that they don't get featured. They just yeah. get less uh, They get less shine. Yeah, you know, they, we do have a socialist party, a communist party in tons of yeah, and here's the deal is I don't even know what it necessarily means to be a Democrat or Republican. You know, I don't I don't know. I hear these terms like liberal and conservative, but I know that it it within these groups of people that identify under a certain political party, there're going to be disagreements between those people on every issue. And so it's almost like it's as scattered um, any political party is going to be as scattered as you know Christianity is, for example, with you know however many forty-three thousand denominations and disagreements and splits. Well, like we said earlier, you know it's the checklist. It's the major issues. Once you feel a certain way about some of the more popular issues, the more important issues, you start to self-identify as a Democrat. You know, I don't think it's that complicated. I mean, if you think uh, education should be free or subsidized greatly by the government. If you think in general social reforms, there should be several social programs that should either be free or subsidized by the government. If you uh, are, if you want religion out of government, which used to be um, a meaningful part of the Republican platform, but nowadays that makes you more of a Democrat. If you are, I don't know. Uh, well, Democrats do tend to go to war a lot, just like Republicans do, but. Typically, they have a different viewpoint when it comes to war. Um, I think it's pretty clear to, to, to see what the difference is between a Democrat and a Republican. I don't think, I don't think it's, it's that confusing. Although Here's people a, like Donald Trump do blur, do tiptoe the line. Here's a challenge for you guys. What's the difference between a Democrat and a socialist? I would say a socialist is a more extreme Democrat. Because Democrats typically do um, endorse the capitalistic forces. You know what I mean? Like a... Many third-party candidates like Ralph Nader, for example, or Dennis Kucinich or whatever, um, they've been critical of um, uh, Democrats who fall prey to lobbyists and get lots of money from uh, big oil, for example, just like the Republicans do. So I, I think Democrats are much more open to uh, capitalism than the socialists. Yeah, I think it's uh, to a large extent it, it depends on how you define socialism. Because almost every politician in this country is for Social Security retirement and they're for Medicaid and Medicare, most, uh, and including probably the majority of Republicans. Uh, and so technically those are socialist programs. And so at what, at what line do you draw and say you're a socialist here and you're not a socialist there? I mean if you're a capitalist who supports certain socialist-like government programs, does that make you a socialist or are you a capitalist? So it's very difficult. But I know that uh, Chris Matthews on MSNBC, he's been asking everyone this who comes on his show, Democrats and Republicans, and uh, I don't. no one's really answered him so far. They all basically can't answer it. So I was wondering if you can, I would throw that out to you guys. But I think that one of the main differences is that if you're a Democrat, you can be a liberal capitalist, whereas if you're a socialist, you're not a capitalist. I mean, to be a true socialist, you're not a capitalist. If you're a Democrat, you can be a liberal capitalist who supports some aspects of socialism, but retains the core of the of a, of a free market. I think it's a textbook definition. I mean, um, it's in the right? it's ownership of certain systems of government. That's the idea. I mean, ownership or government ownership. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I guess maybe we can wrap this one up. Uh, 
Chandler, do you want to uh, just maybe uh, formally end it? Yeah, I guess so. Any optimistic words for the future? Uh, well, I'm not very optimistic about the state of politics in America. Uh, Actually, uh, I am. I am. Great. And the reason why is because I see the demographics changing in favor of the more secular, progressive point of view. And so I would be very scared of the future if I was a socially conservative Republican. I would, the future does not look bleak for them in the next in the next coming decades. But for liberal progressive uh, Democrats or whatever you want to call it, liberals, progressives, the future does look very good. Yeah, well, I hope so. OK, you've been listening to Impersonal Opinion um, with Chandler Klebs, Mitch J and Michael Walsh. And Mitch and Mike did most of the talking because they know what they're talking about, at least. And they know what it means to be a Democrat or Republican or a socialist or a capitalist. So um, I'm sure the listeners will get more out of this than I did. But this will be worth listening to again. I might do some research on this. So thank you for listening and goodbye.